This presentation is called, What is Cultural Group Selection? There are two differences between E.O. Wilson and David Sloan Wilson in terms of how they think about group selection. And to begin with, Edward O. Wilson talks about biological group selection. And what this basically means is the expectation is that group selection operated and shaped human psychology over a very long period of time prior to cultural learning. David Sloan Wilson, on the other hand, focuses on cultural group selection, and this suggests that the psychology of group selection was shaped more recently and co-evolved with culture. A second difference is that Edward O. Wilson views group selection as a source of virtues in contrast to individual selection. So he writes that individual selection is responsible for much of what we call sin, group selection the greater part of virtue. So all of our virtues come from the operation of group selection in Edward O. Wilson's vision. David Sloan Wilson, on the other hand, is much less sanguine about group selection, and he writes that, alas, group selection merely takes us out of the frying pan of within group selection. That's a competition between individuals that leads to selfishness and into the fire of between group interactions. So we'll look more at these differences shortly. But it's worth noting that biological group selection usually requires that differences between groups, and here we're referring to genetic differences between groups, exceed the differences among individuals within those groups. And if we approach it in this way, modern humans are particularly bad candidates for biological group selection. And why do I say that? Well, the arguments I'm going to go over briefly here, you can study them in more depth at a website called understandingrace.org that's published by the American Anthropological Association. But there's three basic reasons why humans are bad candidates for biological group selection. And we're going to refer to these as three massive facts about modern human genetic diversity. And the first massive fact is that we have recent common ancestry. So everyone alive today has a common ancestor probably on the order of 60,000 years ago. And as a result of that, most of our genome is invariant. So 99.9% .9 of the human genome is identical. So let's say you take an individual with roots in Sweden and you compare them to an individual from the Hadza you're going to find that 99.9% .9 of their genome is identical. And that seems impressive, except that still leaves about 3 million nucleotides that do vary. But there's a second massive fact. And the second massive fact is that around 85% of that one-tenth of 1% 1 of variance found in the human genome is found in all populations. And if you want to use the word race there, you have to recognize that races are internally very heterogeneous. The third massive fact is that variation between individuals within races exceeds variation between races taken as groups. And a simple illustration of this is if you're considering getting a blood transfusion, and let's say we're looking at the ABO blood system, it's much more significant to you that you find a donor who has a compatible blood type than it is than you find a donor who belongs to the same race that you do, however you might define race. And you're likely to be able to find a donor who has compatible blood type to you in almost any population on the planet just as you're likely to find individuals who are incompatible with you in almost any population on the planet.
So race is not a terribly useful concept, but this also casts a doubts on the power of biological group selection. And that's one reason why we might be focused on cultural group selection instead. But it's well worth noting, in defense of Edward Wilson's argument, that humans don't seem to let our common ancestry get in the way of our propensity for genocide and war and the ease with which we embrace ethnocentrism. We could fill this slide with scene after scene of genocide just in the 20th century. So David Sloan Wilson argues that in fact, between group selection takes us out of the frying pan and throws us into the fire. The frying pan again is the individual competition within groups, which Edward O. Wilson argues makes us selfish. But the fire, on the other hand, is competition between groups. And this presents itself in phenomena like war and genocide, and at a more fundamental attitudinal level, xenophobia and ethnocentrism. And those aren't particularly virtuous characteristics. So the problem that we faced with arguments based on biological group selection is that there's so much variation within biological populations and it far outweighs differences between them. But David Sloan Wilson proposes that cultural evolution has worked to increase the potency of selection between groups and decrease the potency of selection within groups. And what he means by this is that culture operates to accentuate group level differences, not at a genetic level, but at a cultural level. And it operates to mute uh, those genetic differences within groups and create greater commonalities inside groups. And most of us can recognize intuitively much about the psychology of human groups, including the forces of conformity within groups. And this affects even groups of individuals who try to vary from the norm. Uh, what we often see with deviance is that it's marked by strong conformity so that different subgroups are easily identifiable. But we also are very familiar with hostility between groups. This is a photo to the left here of the Bulgarian Nationalist Party, whose name translates as attack. And on the one hand, of course, they're very patriotic and pro-Bulgarian, uh, but on the other hand, they're very hostile to outsiders who they've marked as threats to the Bulgarian nation. And this includes individuals of Roma descent and also Muslim individuals. So ethnocentrism and xenophobia and conformity are just the stuff of human groups. Now Robert Axelrod has recently created a model of ethnocentrism and it's a fairly simple model. You have actors who have four different arbitrary colors assigned to them. And if you behave ethnocentrically, what that means is that when you meet another individual, another player who's coded with the same color that you are, you behave altruistically towards them and cooperate. But when you meet another individual who's coded with a different color, you defect on them and you don't behave altruistically. And in running this model with different competing strategies, what Axelrod found was that cooperation within groups increased just as ethnocentrism between groups increased. So this proved to be actually a very viable strategy for creating cooperation, uh, simply to show bias on the basis of arbitrary markers and that cooperation then grows right alongside ethnocentrism. That's a rather disturbing finding. And that essay is called The Evolution of Ethnocentrism. You'll find it in the 2006 issue of the Journal of Conflict Resolution. So what is cultural group selection? 
Well, the idea is that culture is learned behavior and cultural markers are rather arbitrary. But what cultural group selection involves is on the one hand, the suppression of individualism within groups that puts pressure on people to cooperate with co-members of their group and the amplification of hostility and differences between groups which similarly puts pressure on people to defect on those who don't belong to their group. Now you might reasonably say, well, does it have to always involve suppressing individualism and amplifying differences? And very often what we call ethnicity and cultural differences appears to be quite benign, but it also appears that it's very easy to rally those differences for nefarious purposes. So look at the world around you and see how many examples of cultural group selection you can identify where there's some element of the suppression of individuality within groups, which could just be individuals dressing alike, and also the amplification of competition and hostility between groups, which might express itself as us-them prejudices. Thank you for listening.